Ladies, gentlemen of the DC Universe, welcome back to a brand new DCU Chapter 1 discussion series video. So we're going to get into quite a bit of fallout of what's happened recently surrounding, you know, the Superman villain rumors. So you guys have had a bit to say about that. Then we've got some DCU Batman stuff, just lots of things within DCU Chapter 1 in of itself, which is what this is about, the DCU discussion series. You guys are going to bounce off my ideas and vice versa. We're going to get into the thick of it. But first of all, before we get into the overall DCU discussion, we need to talk specifically about Superman, I was about to say again, Legacy. But no, really, um, at CinemaCon, I was busy covering a Joker 2 trailer. Check out my breakdown if you haven't done so already. We get super in-depth there. But at CinemaCon, I missed out on covering a little message from David Sweat and Rachel Brosnahan, albeit it wasn't like anything too crazy there. But the one thing we did get, ladies and gentlemen, is... The actual Superman emblem, the crest, the Kryptonian crest in all of its glory. The funny thing is, lots of people are like, the Superman logo reveal, when it's kind of like, well, actually, we've actually seen the Superman crest on Superman's chest from the actual suit itself, from the movie. Granted, that's all we've got so far, and we will actually be talking about the full suit reveal in this video with one of your questions. But I guess, at the same time, Here's an actual very good look at it, because the one that we got from James Gunn on set, you know, it's very zoomed in onto the Superman suit. It's from a slight angle, so here we get a much better look at it face on. Now, I do want to say there are differences here. For example, yes, this is the logo, as we know it's Kingdom Come inspired, but also inspired from multiple eras of Superman blended into this one symbol. What I will say is that this is probably the logo, if you will, that's going to be slapped onto, I don't know, posters, marketing, if there's a toy box of Superman on it, that might be in the corner. Because obviously, even though this is the logo, I, I don't want to get like too excited in terms of, hey, this is exactly what it's going to look like on the suit, all while it kind of is, if you know what I mean, it's also not got the textures on it. Do you know what I mean? So if we take this image here and compare it to the one actually on the suit, yeah, it's the exact same design, but obviously this one's textureless, the one on the suit is textured. So I, I know I didn't really need to point that out, but I, I feel like a lot of people are kind of like taking this version of the logo that we got at CinemaCon and are thinking it's going to look, I don't know, that kind of imbued with light on the suit when it, it, it kind of won't. But either way, you know, it's awesome to get a full look at the logo. We also had James Gunn post a picture of David Sweat's dog again. This time he's uh, in a Superman costume, but in the corner there you can once again see David Sweat's Superman logo on the back of one of the chairs, which is pretty cool. Previously, this image was released, but it was cropped out. But then we had the other logo dropped at CinemaCon, and now he released this full image. I don't really know why he was hiding it before anyway, or whoever was, because, you know, we, we, we kind of saw the logo on the actual suit itself. We also have those attending CinemaCon say, and Eric Davis says here, uh, James Gunn is on screen with a video touting the summer of Superman next year. I actually really love that. Next year will be the summer of of Superman. Lock it in, 2025 is the summer of Superman. Gunn says he and Cast will be at CinemaCon next year, which is awesome. So this time next year, I mean, obviously we'll be very much so ramping up to the release of Superman, but we're going to get the actual cast, I guess, as well as Gunn, you know, at CinemaCon. And I, I'm guessing, to be honest, that's when they could unveil a trailer. Just like how Think the Joker 2 trailer released at CinemaCon, then it dropped online pretty much straight afterwards. Maybe there'll be like another trailer dropping at CinemaCon, or if not the first trailer. And I said another just in case we had a slight teaser before then, but to be fair, you know, this time next year, CinemaCon 2025, it might actually be the first reveal, the first trailer for Gunn's Superman movie. So that's going to be an insanely, insanely exciting time, but I just hope that it doesn't release at bloody 2 a.m. my time, because then, you know, I'll be waking up all the neighbors because I live in an apartment, and they'll be like, shut the hell up, Boba, we don't care about your Superman breakdown video, and I'll be like, you're not a subscriber then. But let's get into the actual discussion series now. So kind of going off of what we were just talking about, and of course, let me know your thoughts on everything we just discussed with the logo and CinemaCon next year down in the comments below. But from the lore cookie here, he says 18 is way too specific of a number for it to not be a hint. So this is from my video the other day, the news roundup, and where I talked about how Gunn replied to a fan saying, yeah, you know, and I, I'm almost ready to show it to you, as in the Superman suit. And he gave what a lot of people, including 
giving myself uh, somewhat reading into here, admittedly, a big hint, a little Easter egg, if you will, of when or the date the Superman full suit reveal could drop. And he says we're 18% of the way through filming. And uh, I agree with the lore cookie here. 18 is kind of way too specific of a number for it to not be a hint. And, you know, 18, also April 18th would be the anniversary of Superman debuting in action comics so um you know uh guys next week we could be getting the suit reveal and you you might very well be seeing a thumbnail with my face just blown up on it just with absolute enamored eyes i i don't know but i'm really hoping that's the case i mean guys we, it could be next week like literally get yourselves ready i don't want to overhype you though but you never say never it, it does seem like something could be happening so random guy who makes videos says please oh please let there be a logo on the back of the superman cape that would be awesome i think they've removed the feature but i really would just love to do a poll right now so maybe just let me know with your comments down in that comment section how many of you would like the Superman emblem, so the one that we know of what it looks like in the movie, on the back. So not exactly the same, it would just be like the gold kind of outline. I personally really, really would love that. I think it looks great. Um, I know some people aren't for it. Like, it's again so fascinating how uh, there's such a big mix of opinions on trunks, no trunks, uh, collar, no collar, crest on the cape, no crest. Let me know. But I think if it looks something like what I'm probably showing on screen, I would be a very, very very happy man. But up next, uh, we have Claudia, uh, Caval Host 9562 say, um, Gunn's clearly challenging people's ability to read. He didn't say there's no clone. He said that the report of a Superman clone being the main villain of the movie is false. Exactly. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I don't want to repeat everything I said in my other video. And I noticed some people are still just like, no, nope, but, but he debunked it. He called the uh, clone thing completely fake. Uh, again, um, he didn't. I kind of agree with Claudia here. I mean, I don't know if I would say that he was challenging people's ability to read. So, like, he's like, oh, I wonder how many people are going to see through me my, you know, potential debunk here and actually realize that I am saying there's a clone. I don't think he had that attitude. But, yeah, no matter what, he didn't say that there wasn't a clone. He, he was just like, yeah, the main villain of the movie is Lex. The main protagonist is Superman. And, you know, none of us were really debating that in the first place with regards to the main villain being Lex. Because that main villain can be Lex even with a clone of Superman created by Lex in the movie. It's just like how, you know, in BVS, for example, you wouldn't call Doomsday the main villain. Uh, he was created by Lex Luthor, and Lex Luthor was still arguably the main villain. So it's, it's that kind of idea and outlook on it. We have Calerion here say, I agree with your take on Gunn's rebuttal. He's no stranger to how people break down every little thing he says. If he really, and this is something I do agree with, like this is something I don't think could be argued with too much. If he really wanted to debunk a clone slash evil Superman rumor, he could have. Yeah, he could have just said there is no Ultraman, there is no clone of any kind. Hasn't happened to this day. Do you know what I mean? He hasn't uh, expanded on it like he has done sometimes in other replies to other rumors where he initially debunked it and then people went into more specifics and he says something like, oh, I thought I was debunking it all. He hasn't done that. <laughs> it's just that original post saying Lex is the main villain. Yeah, he is. So the fact that he didn't leaves it open for the speculation to continue. Maybe there's no clone, but he also doesn't want to debunk every single rumor out there. Fair enough. Uh, so he doesn't specify. But then again, maybe there is a clone and he's getting away with his Denial being a technicality. Exactly. That being said, I would find it weird, and this is what a lot of people kind of find coming out of if this rumor is true, if we go and assume for a second, let's just say it is true. As Clearon says here, I would find it weird if there were a clone slash evil Superman in Corrin Sweat's first outing as Superman. Typically, you would want to establish the character first and show who he is before you start subverting expectations. Given that you already have to set up both Superman and Clark Kent, it feels overly complex to introduce a third Superman at the same time you are laying the groundwork for both of Clark's identities. Evil Superman would be a better secondary villain for the second movie and beyond. On the third hand, since since Gunn has confirmed that Lex is the primary villain, then who is Superman going to fight? Will it be Lex in the war suit? His armored Lex Corp troopers? It does feel like there's a plot element we're missing. Exactly. So, you know, I will address that middle part again with how, you know, I do agree with the, you know, whole uh, analogy I, I say here with how if you think of this clone theory or clone leak, if you will, 
if you judge a book by its cover, it does seem a bit tropey and straightforward. But funnily enough, I, I both agree and somewhat disagree with what Clarion says here. I agree that, yeah, typically you'd want to establish the character first and, you know, before you start subverting expectations, you know, you'd find it weird if there was a clone slash evil Superman in Corrin Sweat's first outing. It is kind of a bit like, hey, wouldn't you do something else first and then maybe in a follow-up installment you'd be like okay now we're doing bizarro or you know a blend of bizarro and ultraman aka just a clone um a darker superman and evil superman you tackle it then but the thing is i i think maybe this is exactly you could argue there is a narrow avenue that gun could be going down where he is achieving both through doing that i think you can set up clark and superman while doing this clone to help aid tell the story of who Clark Kent and Superman is through showing the very antithesis of, and maybe he, you know, for we know, this might end up to be a tragic clone thing if it does end up happening. I need to stress that for people saying, Bobby, you're saying it's happening. I'm not just saying, but initially through showing Superman have to battle, not just physically, but also the optics in public of, you know, this Superman, let's just say the conflict in the Middle East, which has now been repurposed to somewhere else in Europe. Let's just say that Lex's clone goes over there, interrupts something very geopolitically disturbing, because imagine if in our world today, we actually had an America kind of Superman, like everyone knows Superman. I mean, I know Corrin Sweat Superman isn't famous, famous in the DCU, but he is an established hero. And so people link him with the US say or something like that right imagine if he flew over to another country like russia or something like that and just did something really big to the point of other world leaders would think okay wait was this was he sent on behalf of the president or something like that do you know what i mean so imagine clark having to deal with that. i think stuff like this if that you know rumor is true as well this conflict of the middle east which actually did turn out to be true with the basim yusuf thing but it got written out of the script but we're hearing rumors that it's somewhere in europe or whatever if things like that are still in place and we just for a second assume that it's linked to the clone doing something on behalf of Lex to smear Superman's name, you, you would have Superman not only through Superman mode in the suit and the red cape trying to overcome that. You would also have the reporter side, Clark Kent, fighting valiantly alongside Lois to be like, this isn't Superman. I know Superman. And you might have people around him in the Daily Planet. You might even have Perry being like, I don't know, Lois, maybe this Man of Steel isn't everything that you, you said he was in that uh, interview you gave a year ago in the newspaper. Maybe, again, Lois already has a relationship with Superman as, at this point, even if she doesn't know that Superman is Clark Kent working right alongside her. Again, we don't really know how far along any of that is, but just for example's sake. I think, I know I'm rambling quite a bit here, but if you kind of like smush that all up into a ball, believe it or not, you can establish, in my opinion, the character first with Superman and Clark Kent while adjacently doing a dark clone or something like that to, I guess, you know, springboard the very establishment or establishing factors of, hey, this is David Corrinsworth's Clark Kent and Superman in the first Superman movie. Now, I know maybe people would argue there's a better villain or a different villain that could establish Superman and his principles and his morals and this version of Superman more in the first movie. But I don't know. I feel like doing an opposite you, an opposite Superman, can also do the same thing because it's literally another version of you created by Luther. And you're going to have to. It almost forces the main character to establish himself as the Superman and how this guy over there isn't me. That is such a springboard, if anything else, actually. Um, to solidify what Calerion is saying here, establishing the character first and showing who he is uh, in that first film. So I don't know how you guys would feel about that. I think, I, you know, whether you agree or disagree with me there, I think you kind of know what I mean through what I'm going for there. I think if there is a clone that Lex Luthor creates in this film, that's probably what Gunn is going for, because of course he has to establish who this David Corrin Sweat version of Clark Kent is and Superman is in the DCU. Yes, we know we're hitting the ground running, so he's not putting on the cape for the first time. It's not an origin. But nonetheless, this is a DCU where we're meeting him for the first time. Um, even if he's been flying around for all two to three years before this, we need to find out who he is. And I do think a way of doing that can be through, uh, ironically and almost poetically, um, showing another version of him simultaneously in the plot. 
and him having to come out on top of that. So yeah, it provides action eventually with, you know, exchanging blows with this other Superman. It shows the journalistic side through, I'm guessing, Lois and Clark trying to establish that this isn't Superman, despite how many people believe that this is. Uh, all kinds of things like that. Who knows how far this can go, but... When I say all of that out loud, I think through all this trial and tribulation and this crucible that Clark will have to go through, that is an establishing arc of who he is, if anything else. So I know I've said the same thing in different ways, but I, I actually do like the idea of that when I talk and talk and talk about it. Other than that, you know, I do think, you know, who is Superman going to fight, even clone aside here? I think, you know, the engineer will potentially, as I've always said, start off on the wrong foot with Superman, but I think it'll be done in the right way from uh, Angela, the, the engineer's point of view. Calirion mentions here his armored LexCorp troopers. Again, one of the inspirations on top of All-Star Superman is Superman for all seasons. And in that story, he has, as I've mentioned quite a few times, you might be getting sick of me saying this, guys, but he has the Guardians of the City. So Luther wants to be the man of tomorrow. He wants to be the protector of uh, Metropolis and the world. I mean, he, you know, in his ego, he wants to be admired, not this Superman who's just been born with these abilities. Like, why him? Like, I have worked my way here. I'm doing this. So maybe he could have his own guardians of the city per se maybe they're not going to be these big robotic looking things but something akin to that and they could even uh factor into it because you know the thing is compared to metahumans or superman the guardians of the city are kind of negligent at the same time they, they, they will try to help but for example in for all seasons there's this one scene and where there's still a lady left behind in the burning building and superman comes along and he's just like get the hell out of here like you guys are useless and uh, he flies in there and saves her and they would have let her die so all of these things can play into it now as for lex in the warsuit i don't think so i don't i think that'd be I, you know it's funny to say that would be premature when you know there could be a clone in this movie um but i don't think we'll be getting to warsuit right now that would be yeah that would to me when i think of lex warsuit i do not think this the first superman movie now i know people could say that about the clone but i find the clone more believable of a story even for the first movie compared to lex gearing himself up in a bloody warsuit that's kind of i wouldn't say necessarily end game level stuff but it is quite far along Screw it, Lex mode, if you know what I mean. Up next from J. Kell saying, I do think the like on Teen Titans being fake is a purposely cryptic response. And I, I know where you're going with this one, and I'm optimistic that it could be something like this as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know, before we continue, uh, James Gunn liked to post saying, hey, James, can you also uh, confirm if the Teen Titans Hollywood reporter scoop, you know, major trade in Hollywood, saying that Anna Naguera, the, the writer of Supergirl, is writing a script for the Teen Titans movie is fake. Like, can you say it's completely fake? And he liked it. So we're like, wait, wait no, 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 no Teen Titans movie? What's going on? Now, James told us that this universe was inspired by Justice League Unlimited in Young Justice. Uh, so in my mind, clearly we will get a team of sidekicks that resemble Young Justice. However, I am not sure that it will be called Young Justice, but it also doesn't make sense for them to be called Teen Titans because they all were not teens or did not stay teens. My theory is that we will see these characters age up from teens to adults in the DCU, possibly Dick starting off as Robin and becoming Nightwing later, uh, much like we did in every season of Young Justice. I also believe that Damien, Blue Beetle, Hawkgirl, Kendra Saunders, and Supergirl will be a part of the team. So my takeaway here with what Jay is saying is that I'm optimistic that the like that Gunn gave there, acknowledging, you know, if you take his like literally, he's basically saying, can you say it's fake? I've liked your post. It's fake. Could mean that the way the Hollywood Reporter gave that headline to everyone saying, Anna Naguera writing a Teen Titans movie like live action movie for the DCU isn't technically accurate in the way it was presented. For example, you know, you could say, what if it's a Teen Titans animated project? What if it's an animated DCU show? What if it's a live action DCU show like Lanterns rather than a live action movie? But it doesn't mean necessarily that we're not going to get a Titans project in the DCU. It's just, as I keep saying here, maybe the way the Hollywood Reporter dished it or what they heard was kind of interpreted in a way that isn't accurate. So I do think we, I, I I mean, I am so adamant that we're going to get a Titans project of some kind, but maybe, yeah, it's just not going to be a live action Teen Titans movie because, you know, it, it, that was always possible with the way it was presented, right? You know, you've got Brave and a Bold, Damian Wayne comes in, he's going to start off as a little murderous ninja assassin, as Gunn said, but by the end of the movie, he's going to be obviously 
maybe calmed down a little bit more and he's going to be staying on, but he's still going to be very much so Damian Wayne in demeanor, I'm sure. And that's where coming off of Brave and the Bold, I'm not saying it'll be the next project afterwards, but after the chronology in the DCU, after the timeline of Brave and the Bold, eventually we'll get a project where maybe Damien is kind of shoved off into the Titans. Maybe Bruce thinks that it'll be good for him to go along with Grayson and just, you know, learn the ropes and maybe with people of a similar age. You know, again, adaptations don't copy and paste. So, you know, one thing I really do want, and when I was trying to figure this out, I was just like, okay, well, if it's Teen Titans with Damien, will Nightwing even be in that group? Because, you know, maybe it'll be a situation where the Titans has been a team that has gone through different iterations, and currently the current Teen Titans is with Damien Wayne in it and these other heroes maybe. But the adult Titans has gone on to be led by Dick Grayson, who used to be in the Teen Titans in his Robin days. And, you know, we assume that because we assume that maybe by the time Damien comes along in the Brave and the Bold movie, Dick Grayson is no longer in Robin mode anymore. He is Nightwing, and maybe you have Tim Drake possibly uh, in the Robin mode, the Robin of the Batcave, when Damien gets dropped off by Talia at the beginning of the film. Either way, I think Gunn didn't... This is the one thing we have to also take out of this, guys. No matter what with this like situation, I know this is technically a debunk of a kind, but Gunn didn't answer this directly. Normally he says, true, this is true, or this is not true. And he's done that before with major trade reports. Like, literally, he's said things like, you know, as much as I actually really like this reporter, I have to say that this one isn't true, right? This time, he didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. He didn't say it was true. He didn't say it wasn't true, other than this like. Eventually, we got that like. So that tells me that I think, just like as he hasn't confirmed news before, um, because of there may be truth, grains of truth to it, but for legal reasons, because deals may not be fully signed or teams may not be fully formed or this, that, and the other, it would be too premature to be like, yes, what the Hollywood reporter scooped, I can now confirm. Like, it's still, like, it's still news he wants to talk about, but not quite yet for all kinds of behind the scenes reasons. So I think the fact that he hasn't actually explicitly said no, not true, or yes, true, is a big telling sign that there is grains of truth to what the Hollywood reporter said. So I do think there is a Titans-esque, Young Justice-esque, sidekick-esque project happening, losing my voice here, but as it was reported and presented, don't get technically too excited by the idea of a live action DCU Teen Titans movie. But is Anna Naguera penning a script of something Titans related? It probably is the case. Yeah, it's just, you know, they're still ironing out the creases with how to, I guess, formally reveal that to us. And when it's even ready to be announced for all kinds of behind the scenes, legally kind of deal kind of reasons, maybe. But I would love to know your thoughts on that. And what could be, even with that like in mind that James Gunn gave that fan on threads, what could the actual project be? What will it be when it's brought to fruition and when it's actually confirmed to us? Will it be more Teen Titans? Maybe not. Will it be Adult Titans? Will it be like a blend of all of this? Young Justice slash Titans slash, you know, what if? What if we're all surprised and Robin in the Brave and the Bold movie, again, as per adaptations don't copy and paste, is still Dick Grayson? What if he, as of Brave and the Bold, is in the transition to Nightwing? You can never say never, honestly, despite what we may know as super traditional canon with the way things should go or the way the chronology of the Bat family should go. We all should know by now in films, even if they want to be comic accurate, innovations do take place, as I keep saying, and that means sometimes they take some creative liberties there to do things just a little bit differently, all while still being... You know, let's just say the character is still very comic book accurate. Up next from Glenn Taylor saying, Praying they cast a complete unknown as Batman. Something completely fresh would be amazing. And I was actually speaking about this in a recent live stream and how usually the unknowns are for Superman. It's, it's weird how it works, isn't it? Like, you know, Henry Cavill was, you know, barely fresh coming off the Tudors when he landed Superman. I wouldn't say he was crazy. I mean, he was known, but like not crazy, crazy known. You know, obviously Christopher Reeve, then there's Brandon Routh. But when it comes to 
Batman, you've, you've had pretty big people play them. You know, Christian Bale, Ben Affleck. So if they followed suit with that, it would be that as per, you know, James Gunn, Superman, David Corrin-Sweat, you know, fairly unknown. Do people know him to like Ben Affleck levels? No. So they're following suit with the Superman thing there. But will they follow suit with the Batman casting? So will Batman in the DCU not be like a David Corrin-Sweat level of casting, but they might get quite a big actor to try and land that role? Or for once, will they actually get a Batman actor who is as known as David Corrin Sweat? Now, that would be super interesting. And I wonder how people would react to that, because it would be the first time in a very, very, very long time in where they actually got an actor who I, I just I feel like people would be weird about it for some reason, because even though whenever it comes to a Superman, for the most part, it's been an actor who's not really known by people to the equivalency of somebody huge like, I don't know, let's just say Ben Affleck again. Um, but whenever we get Batman, we're used to it being someone famous. So would it be weird for Batman to be, again, an unknown to the extent of David Cornsweet's level? And would people be like, oh, why? who is this guy? Who is this guy? But when it comes to Superman, people don't really say that. I, I, do you see what I'm trying to say there? But technically, there would be nothing wrong with casting Batman as an actor who is fairly unknown because you know no matter what at the end of the day all that matters is that you've got the right person for the job can they pull off batman can they be really convincing in the role and if anything this could be their rise to fame i don't know it's, it's just an interesting thing to ponder because i think people are going to be like okay with an unknown ish superman actor but when it comes to a batman actor if it's an unknown actor to an extent they're going to kind of melt down but then if they actually end up liking him in the performance they'll be happy about it if you know what i mean and what are even the deciding factors that go into that in the DCU so far like if if we're being blunt and candid about it we haven't got any like truly massive 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 names I mean think about David Corrin where Superman you know we, we, people may have watched him in things before but he's not a huge A-list or anything. Rachel Brosnahan, she is probably quite a bit more well-known than David Corrin Sweat. She's been in quite a few things. Um, sure, you've got Perry White. You've got, like, these other actors in there who are known, but there's still no, like, again, just for the sake of example, like Ben Affleck level of, um, hey, we, ever, we everyone knows who Ben Affleck is. So will they decide for Batman by the time his casting comes around, okay, maybe we need a bigger star pull to the DCU at that point in time? I don't know. But you could, like, if, if you're going to say that about that, why not start off like that with Superman? Why not have got a massive star for Superman? So I don't think it really matters. I mean, I think we're all used to having a big star for Batman, but I think just like David Corrinsway, of whom I'm over the moon with and didn't really know who he was before this casting, why would I act any differently when it came to a Batman casting? So long as they are right for the role, that is, that's all that matters, despite how big their body of work or how popular or famous, if you will, their body of work has been up until that point. I do like the idea of a fresh face as well, actually, because when it comes to David Corrin Sweat, you know, when the front runner list was being named and it's like I was doing my research, looking more into him and just falling more and more in love with that. Something There's something enticing about it being fresh and also a perfect casting. You're almost excited on behalf of them and the opportunity they have. Because not only, not only do you know that they're so right for the role, it's like, man, this could be dynamite, right? So imagine the equivalent for a Batman actor who maybe, again, I, there might be a front runner list and I'm, I might be like, okay, I don't really know who this guy is. Okay, I see that he's been in like one or two things, but he's not clearly like massive A-lister. So like, what if he's so well fit for the role? And I'm like, I'm excited for this guy. And maybe this could be such a springboard for his career as well. Who knows, guys? Let, let, let me know your thoughts there. I know there's a lot of fan castings already, and I know one day, guys, one day I'll get to my Batman fan casting video addressing your fan castings. It's been in the works for months, basically. Everyone always asks me, hey, Boba, waiting for your Batman fan casting video. I'm very aware of the names. I just need to make sure I've done all my research so I can... I feel like competently talk about everyone with confidence and how I feel about them, but I just haven't got round to that yet. But my, my point is Batman's usually always a big actor. Superman's usually kind of not really a big actor. Will the status quo continue or will things be changed up? Another one here from Clearon saying, I like the idea of a nuanced take on Talia. I feel like the popular image of her is a completely villainous one, where many people seem to believe she, <laughs> words, 
Bruce. I think it's written that way in at least one story, but like that person was saying in their thread, there are other takes on her that are not so villainous. I hope we get a complex and morally grey Talia who has a really good reason to bring Damien to Bruce and isn't just a bad mum abandoning her kid. And I agree. The, the, the thing about that situation with Talia is that a long time ago, it, it, you know, there was even a situation of where that wasn't the case and she actually gave up. She pretended that she... I think had a miscarriage with Damien and she actually gave him up for adoption, uh, you know, which is, you know, a whole thing. But then with Grant Morrison, uh, let's just say that Bruce was drugged and uh, God, and then they kind of flip flopped again. And, you know, it was quite consensual. And then, you know, I, I think they went back again and it was a drug situation. So I, I don't think it has to be that. Um, if we're being honest here, um, obviously it does paint her in a very, messed up very incredibly messed up sense but um there is a talia which is again as clearion is saying here that is a lot more nuanced in the version and where you know that night happened but not out of any kind of drugging situation maybe batman doesn't even realize of i don't know let's just say not really thinking it through that she ended up getting pregnant but regardless of that you know she can be portrayed and i've always said this as well like i really like the idea of talia bringing Damien to the Batcave to drop Damien off because there's a situation going on with Ra's al Ghul in where, just like the comics as well, he perhaps wants to use Damien as his host body, if you will. He wants to, con like, the Lazarus Pit, let's just say, isn't so effective anymore. And then there's this whole looming shadow threat of Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins eventually, especially as there's a bit of a grudge against Bruce anyway, because he was meant to be the heir to the demon, and, you know, he thwarted that plan of Ra's's. And now, you know, Ra's could be infuriated at the idea of now his new heir has been given to Batman, the one who said no in the first place. So now both of his heirs are gone. And um, yeah, it could be quite a complex story that is, you know, really ripples out into so many different factors. You know, Tyler could be quite involved. I'm not saying Raz is going to like arrive to the Batcave of Army of League of Assassins, but there could be all kinds of repercussions of that uh, that happen in the long run of the DCU for Batman. And in turn, showing that... Talia isn't the way she has been depicted as straight up villainous and you know sometimes it is quite one dimensional it's like hey my love I just want to be with you if you don't want to be with me then I'm going to do something so diabolical and terrible until the point of wait do you want to be with me okay if not well I'm going to do this horrible thing and it's just like she is just kind of evil evil lady it's just like evil evil for evil's sake whereas there is a lot more depth to her in other versions and you know i think bringing talia in as well we could get some cool scenes of you know bruce doesn't always work out in every relationship but you know as per that thread we went over in that video and if you don't know what i'm talking about uh james gunn reposted this thread from this user who went over like this history of talia that was a lot more nuanced a lot more complicated and how her own bruce connect on quite these uh intimate levels and where bruce actually doesn't connect with other female characters that he's been involved with but only uniquely to talia in these certain ways and yeah sure it might not have worked out between bruce and talia in the dcu but there could still be that unique connection that they have that isn't just um antagonistic you know they're, they're actually on okay terms and they still have a decent relationship even if it's one that isn't so frequent in communication until you know i guess you know hey bruce uh here's your son so yeah i would love to know what you guys think of talia are you a fan of her how much do you know about her are you just more familiar with the morrison run or uh various other iterations let me know down in the comments below and just how you would like to see talia involved and even let me know any theories with how you think damien and the reason why damien gets dropped off on bruce's doorstep why that should happen in the first place and do you think it could pertain to whatever diabolical plans Raz could have actually had and thus Talia protecting her child. So Cremona74 says, Hey Boba, love your videos. Thank you very much, man. Keep up the good work. Uh, with regards to this latest on Soups, I never believed or wanted to believe this evil Soups is the main villain story. I always thought the main guy would be Lex. However, there will be other antagonists. What if the engineer pre-nanotech works for Lex in his labs, develops the tech there with or without his help, but Lex believes he owns it and wants to use it against Soups. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, adaptation don't copy and paste guys so even though that's not really the backstory behind the engineer the thing is she is somebody who who literally through her work on nanotech injects pints of nanotech liquid nanotech into her bloodstream and she she then becomes as a result you know she, she can coat the li 
liquid metal over her skin, create cyborg-esque weapons conjuring out of her freaking arm. So... When I say adaptations don't copy and paste, I wouldn't be surprised if you did actually have the engineer work in a department at LexCorp. Maybe, I know this sounds like almost like an early 2000s kind of superhero story like Raimi Spider-Man. So, you know, working in the lab, you know, and put, doing something with the lab, injecting yourself. Oh, now I'm, you know, this person. But I'm not saying it'll be that straightforward, but I do think that'd be quite a... Uh, you know, storyline rooted in what I was saying, maybe conflicted loyalties initially. You know, maybe the engineer, Angela, does that. She becomes, you know, kind of proto-engineer. So this could explain the look that we got of the set picture of her in that suit. Um, even though I think a reason for that, by the way, could actually be, um, you know, in the comics, she's quite literally naked. Like when she decloaks, if you will, from her nanotech, she's kind of like, oh God, there's some comic panel showing that. it's uh, it, Oh God, the, the chrome is disappearing. It's just, oh, I need a bathrobe, if you know what I mean, before you see things. So I do think she will be coated everywhere, but, you know, maybe as we've explored in those theories, the, the black suit that she was wearing could be and post changed to the chromey looking metal. My point being, my point being, maybe initially she hasn't mastered the nanotech abilities that may come to full fruition by the end of the film or even in the authority movie itself. But initially we see her exploring her abilities in the film while other things unfold and while she's going for or after Superman. So yeah, maybe A, she could be working for Lex. Maybe her origin is in the film. Maybe she's already the engineer. That's another possibility. Still working at LexCorp or on behalf of Luther, but still coming to terms with her abilities. Either way, um, I do think something like that could be involved, but I'm open to every idea like this because... As I always say, adaptations just don't copy and paste. There's inspirations, there's innovation. As I always say as well, don't deviate to the point where you alienate fans. You know, don't deviate from the source material so much that the engineer is really just a freaking Teletubby. You know, that that's no longer the engineer. But you can definitely change things up and... Uh, you know, it could be little things like this. So Willy Willy T says here, clone or not, I just really despise that people want to know the plot so badly. Just let Gun cook and hope uh, we are all pleasantly surprised next year. I can't take scoop culture anymore. Well, the thing is, I mean, I agree. Like I, I watched even 3C's video here and um, it's, it's, he said more or less what I was saying in terms of, the Ultraman or, you know, as I say, I don't think he would be called Ultraman with regards to this whole rumor. It would be like an inspiration of Ultraman because the leak already said that it, it's not like a multiverse crime syndicate version of which Ultraman is. So already that's not inherently Ultraman, right? It would be like a blend of Bizarro, probably Ultraman. And I know some people then say, well, wh why just not make it Bizarro? I get what you're saying. Regardless, I do feel like that would be alluded to in the teaser trailers or the official trailer one or the final trailer. So I, I think... Look, but I will say first and foremost, if you don't want to know anything, even theories and speculation from fans who do it like myself and in this community, because it excites us. It helps build anticipation. We like brainstorming things because it really does just rally that momentum of fandom for what we're looking forward to. However, you know, I think that's a bit of a misconception that for some reason you can't do that without, you know, wanting every twist and turn and like line of dialogue spoiled. That's really not the case, actually far from it. So the, the whole clone thing isn't really uh, something that I would expect to be a major spoiler in the movie, believe it or not. Again, it's something, as 3C said, and what I've said, I, I think could actually be featured in the trailers. If anyone doesn't want to know anything or just wants to get strict updates in terms of, okay, official photo of Superman revealed, okay, I'm happy to know that, then fair enough. But I don't think there's anything wrong with speculating. I mean, I've been doing this for years about the Batman, and it's like, oh, Barry Keoghan, everyone thinks he could be playing a Joker, so we dived into that, and we dived into this clue, and that clue, it excites us. But no, did I want to know that, um, I don't know, Riddler would do this and create the Flood and end up in Arkham and maybe we actually thought that he knew that he was Bruce Wayne and it turned out he didn't? Did I want to know that it was like a swap out there? No, I don't want to know things like that. Do I want to know in Superman the movie, Gun Superman, that if the Kents were in it, that Jonathan Kent dies in the third act? No, I, I don't want to know that. Do I want to know that Luther gets bested in this specific way and outed because of something to do with this you know, clone bit that gets exposed by Lois Lane's report at the Daily Planet. No, I don't want to, I don't want to know that. But like, you know, main stuff like this is kind of like, hey, okay, we hear a rumor um, and I don't mind talking about it. And I think a lot of people are of the same mind. Now, what I will meet you halfway with there is that I do think the scoops or the leak culture can be problematic when it comes to that. So if there's like a little 
t tidbit like saying, oh, creature commandos could be set on Dinosaur Island, aka the center. Okay, that's cool. You know, that's not too spoilery. It's something, you know, let's just say if that was true in the show, it's the setting of the show. Now we can speculate about, oh, what if the center is the big bad of DCU chapter one? Because that is a very formidable threat, right? But if Alika was to say, okay, no, so it turns out in the third act, like, I don't know, Henry Cavill's Man of Steel snaps Zod's neck. That would be something that is just too far and does give away, I think, just way too much, obviously, about the movie. So translate the ending of Man of Steel over to what would happen in Superman with David Corrinsweet's Superman or any DC project. That would just be a bit too much. Or, for example, I would deem another um, one would be Lanterns. What is this ancient, terrifying horror? If a scooper or a leaker said, I have got concrete proof, here's the proof, here's a picture of uh, how Jordan and Jon Stewart stumbling across the actual... Uh, ancient horror. Here's the spoiler. Episode four of season one. Bang. That is too much. I don't mind clues along the way making us think, oh, could this relate to this? Oh, could this mean that, I don't know, uh, something to do with Necron's veil is being pierced and, I don't know, he's maybe getting out um, into our plane. I, I don't know, but like, I don't mind going down avenues like that. It it's, it's playing with it. And what I will say lastly on this is I never let things like this set up expectations. Now, this is the biggest thing that I think that could happen with some people that creates a negative outcome. So expectations can lead to disappointment, as everyone's heard, right? So whenever you theorize, don't ever, for one second, even when it comes to, I don't know, something like we're pretty sure about, the reverse kingdom come theory, don't think, okay, this is happening for a thousand percent certainty, because more often than not, if it doesn't happen, or you thought something was going to happen a certain way based on theory, you, if it doesn't happen, you'll be like, oh, well, I thought that was going to happen and didn't happen. And, you know, what happened instead in the movie, I don't find as cool as my theory. So therefore, screw this. That's not good. No, don't do that. Please don't ever do that. Theorize, speculate, get enjoyment out of it, but never put all of your, you know, chips onto said theory or expectation. Or don't even let it become an expectation in the first place. You can have reasonable expectations like, you know, Corrin Sweat Superman is an established hero. Okay, we expect that. Things like that. We expect Luther to be the main villain. Okay, let's uh, speculate there. But beyond that, it's a dangerous game. Um, I do understand some people's frustrations with it. It would be interesting to get your guys' takes on what I just said and what uh, Willy Willy T said there. But I, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's not as bad as some people make it out to be, but at the same time, it can be uh, negative um, at times as well. But ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm going to end this DCU Chapter 1 discussion series video there. I'm going to be keeping my eyes glued to that comment section. I know I say this all the time, but I absolutely love making these. Uh, we have obviously a big DC community on this channel, and I love how much you guys love these videos as well. So again, uh, let me know any and all thoughts down in that comment section, and I'm sure I'll screenshot some of them for the next bounce back of discussion between me and you for the next discussion series video. If you got to this point, we'd really appreciate you letting YouTube know that you're enjoying this video by leaving a like on it. Is I know probably right now you might not be doing it, but hey, if you're on your phone or even on your TV, just hit the like button. Thank you very, very much. If you're brand new here, do consider subscribing for any and all updates just like this and breakdowns and theory videos, all of that good stuff. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see all of you DC family in the next video. Goodbye.